My name is Ricardo Pauliosa, and I'm going to be reading poems of mine, most of them based on paintings, a lot of them on Japanese Edo period art, and others on contemporary or modernist art. Uh, these are poems that were, have been published since the appearance of my last book, The Turning, from Carnegie Mellon University Press in 2018. Um, I, I'm an art critic and collector, and uh, so art, the visual arts have always played a huge role in my sensibility as a poet as well. This first poem is entitled The Dream of the Fisherman's Wife, after a very famous and a bit raunchy um, a print by Hoxai, one of the great 19th century Edo period painters. The Edo period starts around the early 1600s in Japan and continues through the middle of the 1800s. It was a time in which Japan was finally consolidated politically into a shogunate, the, the Tokugawa shogunate, and it had a tremendous amount of stability after many years of civil war. And, uh, and this led to a flourishing of, of art and culture and the emergence of Edo. Edo was the original name of what is now known as Tokyo. Oh, it also references that print and another print by Hokusai. In the other print, there's a fisherman on a rock trying to catch fish and this, these huge waves are crashing on the rocks. It's kind of a very dramatic picture. And it references also Susano uh, no Mikoto, who is one of the three major gods of the Shinto um, pantheon. And he's responsible for the god of the, of the ocean, but also of other things like diseases and various other things. He's a bit of a trickster god also. Sumida is a, a port city near Edo, now part of Greater Tokyo, and where Hokusai lived. Oh, don't stop, the lone figure on the edge of a coastal rock says to the wave that is raking the fish toward him. Scare more my way. Susan all pities him above the others who have ships and teams. The poor man spends days here to stave off hunger. His young wife endures the absence and danger, feeds her paltry babes. Some nights she has a visitor, bulbous head and fists for eyes. He craves the taste of her loins. The welcome marauder lives among them. Some villagers rave about his skill, a celebrity for a neighbor in meager Sumida. Art makes him brave the scandal. For who else could procure such beauty bereft, sweep them into depraved habits, and roll them into the endless pure? He'd give her a print, but what would the husband say? In the image, uh, there's an octopus, actually there's two, and the octopus is also an important creature in uh, Shinto mythology. It's a minor deity, um, from, comes from the folklore of the northern island of Hokkaido. Hiroshige is uh, roughly contemporary with Hokusai, and like Hokusai did wonderful prints, um, prints became very popular during this period, uh, woodblock prints, because since the people of Japan could travel internally but not out of the country and had very limited contact with foreigners, uh, the, the prints kind of advertised, if you will, the different sights and visions of their native land, and, and many people traveled internally. They got to know their own country. This is from a series of views of Edo by Hiroshige, Kiyobashi Bridge and Bamboo Yards, 1857. A pictograph of bridge, moon, and merchant caught Whistler's eye. We are drawn instead to the presaged skyline of our time, the burdened nets of rationed clouds, the hard-edged rampart of vertical wealth 
that shares Central Park in many photos and films. Doubtful as those bamboo stocks climbed our colossal norm, yet the travelers on the oral arc are likewise scaped by gray torrent. The artist swells the view to shine the lone boatman's take of his unimportant fate and beckons dual perceptions by one strangeness. Their path is what their view will mold. Afloat, his mind becomes our world foretold. That poem was published in Stand, by the way. The previous one was published in a magazine called Ekphrasis. This one also was first published in Stand magazine from England. And it's from, uh, it's inspired by Tawaraya Sotatsu, his famous poems of the 36 immortal poets over a painting of cranes, a series of screens. The calligraphy was by Koetsu, the cranes uh, flying over these these poems uh, by Sotatsu. And this is circa 1600, so it's really a transition between the previous period, known as the Heinan period, and the beginning of the Edo period. Art resists the destiny of fragility. Are the cranes manic as mist and the wind the foil to language? Do strokes symptom pity in their molten lace, while flocks pretend the scrolled horizon cannot truly end. Transcendence has a cynical accountant who harps the abacus beads on golden bars. He wagers on luck against abundant skill and is nearly right when he's half wrong. Flight ambiguous. The image is a shell for the story of how signs drive a throng's escape on silk. From the painting's well a treasoned freedom springs. What soars? The cranes in rebel stream? The words as oars? These poems are mostly sonnets, Shakespearean sonnets, with some variations on the form that I play with. This one is three sonnets. It's also inspired by uh, a wonderful painting by Sotatsu called Waves at Matsushima. And it has an epigraph from a modern poem by Hridaya, a great poet of Nepal, who's from his poem, Sugata Sauraba, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, which is about the, the life of Buddha. Uh, it references Devadatta, who, who was a, uh, a, an early disciple of Buddha who then later tries to take away his disciples and even tries to kill him on more than one occasion. I mean, the guy becomes like the the, the, the equivalent of Judas in the Buddha story. And at the end of his life, he tries to, you know, repent and get Buddha's forgiveness, but on the way to see Buddha, uh, uh, the, the ground opens up and swallows him. <laughs> so from Hridaya, whether Devadatta was cast into hell or not is uncertain, but he never, never came back from the swamp. Devadatta is the voice that you'll hear in the third stanza, sonnet stanza of the poem. The, the, the screen, the painting deals with, you know, obviously rocks and waves, and it's very beautiful. Um, and, and, and the speaker slowly emerges as like, what, is, what does an artist really know about turmoil? Uh, if you want to know about turmoil, you have to talk to someone like me, in other words. And this poem was published in Hotel America. The planet scalds with strife, the castled stone against the gnawing sea, 
the sword of sun piercing the moon hush. There is no peace here which tempts those failed refugees of savor despair to head for the heart of the wheel, rummage, tune, and shed the lambent will. This world defames the temperance of flame, for no fires assail the snow that tames Fuji. Between mayhems, the gods sleep. The waves need no tinder sparked to reap the gravel that once invincibility claimed. The shore's only order is a fiction framed by the eye. He walks convinced he is the author of a burning, drowning, warring, fleeing surrender. In poured creams of gold, Sotatsu combs the sea as hottest flames and metals snow. The waves trapped in cove and cauldron foam into teeth. By color they kin the winter show of mounds, all stillness and deceit, for nowhere but on silk can a mind sleep kindly, unadorned with fear. Measures neat and swirls that shot granite and sky keep the thunder of some god at bay and lets the artist's demon rest free contained. The slash of tidal blades on rock tests the valiant eye who wonders if restrained. A painting masters more the world than one who races into it howling wounded hound. He knew and painted the hells I've borne and live. For in these depths, thrown from cold to hot, no future or past, the chained find relief in timelessness. The ebb and high are caught in the equal mirrors of the damned mind. From here alone does cause mate with effect and blossom rot and perfume, slash and caress. The pure waves of satin tracks that surge with flotsam procure a stubborn pleasure, a friction of demise and return. He surely heard my derelict muse and gathered sea to banner the rise of light I've earned in darkness. A soul wrecked will echoes find in art to grammar misery, heal expulsion and burn like incense or memory. The next uh, poem is entitled Ogata Korin, Red and White Plum Blossoms. Uh, circa 1714, so we're about a hundred years after Sotatsu and now deep into the Edo period. But prints haven't quite come into their own yet. They're starting to, perhaps, but we're still dealing with paintings and screens. And this is one of the most famous ones. It describes a, a very beautiful, almost abstract, curving river with wonderful swirls, and on each side, uh, a tree, a red blossom and a white, a red plum blossom and a white uh, plum tree in blossom. Uh, Corning uh, and came up with this very modern, daring uh, uh, technique uh, of dripping paint onto wet paint to create the illusion of texture as in the bark of the trees. 1714, I mean, you know, my goodness, I mean, the modernists wouldn't, haven't even shown up yet, let alone come up with stuff like that. Right? And in fact, art of this period in Japan had an enormous influence on the emergence of modernism in Europe. Uh, major artists like Van Gogh and, uh, and Degas and others collected uh, uh, the art of this period. All of them were very knowledgeable in it. Whistler, others. Three rivers have I, the curves reveal them. The only one is brave enough to call himself a river. Ignore the hero, 
Pretend he too is a mystery. In fact, in our creation, so few things hide perfectly from the name we give them. Tree, far from sight, though we can touch it, shelter rain and daily sway from sweat. Getting its bark right meant dripping paint on wet paint until a turbulence disclosed its jewel condition. Then it taught the constant flow constraint. Blossom, the stream retorted, was the mission of his desperate brood. They seek the pond of death and petals where future wrestles them to rest. The tree took refuge from the aimless swirls to boast the lineage signed by jagged words, the branches jotted on the golden earth. The infinite is a language too, and not the sum of distances, but river blinded on a road above an intricate innocence. And though he mocks dizziness, each curl foretells the knotted grains a tree becomes. I fall, but am never felled, his tactile scroll asserts. They then agreed to be the spirits of the day, time compelled, but moments rebels. Two seasons will guard their station in this painting, whose model trunks tell half the story and leave to loom the part where none step twice, petals in place of husks. And that poem appeared in the American Journal of Poetry. This one appeared in the Bombay Review out of India. It's a sonnet entitled Never Tiger. A lot of these Japanese artists uh, were intrigued by different animals, tigers, lions, monkeys, and they hadn't seen any of these in Japan at that time. Um, they, they had seen them maybe in Chinese paintings. Those animals had, were even going extinct in China and so, or, or very hard to find. And so it became a, a bit like bizarre and, and mythological, this particular lion that Hokusai painted on a fukusa. Uh, looks like a lot like a dragon, actually. Um, a fukusa is a, a cloth, not very big, that artists would paint and use them as a covering for gifts. So it was like the early gift wrapping, except that you never, you usually kept the fukusa. Uh, unless like the, the, the recipient of the gift was extremely powerful and you really wanted to find out, so you left them with the focus as well. Never tiger. For most artists, it suffice to throw a tiger pelt on a house cat and claim the beast of soul was captured in the silk of mind. The error was so common as to resist the test of facts. When tigers finally came to zoos in Kyoto, Edo, and Osaka. Then the real cat rose in rebellion against truth's contrivance. Still, those proffered rank ideal burned through the tinder of vagrant hearts. The leap was taken by the aged Hokusai, whose lion on a Fukusai is dragon spun, a portrait freed from deep unraveled thought at its triumph ravenous. He shuns those sleepy reeds where others stir, an old youth might just this hunger master. Hiroshi, back with him, did a very famous series called The 53 Stations of the Tokaido. The Tokaido was a road, it was a, a road mostly by the sea, that connected Edo, the new political, economic, and cultural capital under this period, with Kyoto, which was the beautiful, reclusive capital where the emperors still lived. Ostensibly, they were still emperors, but they didn't have much power during this period. That would change later in the mid-1800s when the emperors came back and retook power and that became known as the Meiji Restoration. 
the 53 stations, I should say also, there's a station roughly at every point, more or less, where somebody, that somebody would walk for a day so that the station would be where you would rest. Some of them are in, some of them are a little, you know, skimpier. Um, but that's what these stations were about. And the series uh, basically describes a, a journey of a daimyo, which was a, a lord, an aristocrat, with his retinue of servants and so forth, traveling from El to Kyoto. And it also has a, a, a first image and a last image, which are not part of the 53 stations. This is the 24th station in the 53 stations of the Tokaido. The series was done between 1831 and 1834. And uh, the title of the poem is Hiroshige Kanaya. A season tips its hand with cresting waters, or so the travelers surmise. For what else could explain the lack of a bridge across these tatters that once a reeded bank so calmly pulsed? From afar, an artist watches the servants stripped, flushed from struggle in winter thaw, their master hoisted and his luggage too. They drop like shells on the final sand, blank as if it were a sea. Were these obedience not here to tell the ground from open tide, our eyes adrift in distance would wager coast and fishing hamlet and wonder in reckless poise how maps could get it so wrong and be trusted still. A pallet mines the lost that currents soon forget poem first appeared in the American Journal of Poetry. And one of the curious things, even though the, the shoguns built roads all over Japan, they didn't build a lot of bridges um, for some reason. And uh, this is one image in which they're crossing, you know, fording these, these, uh, these currents in this uh, river. Hiroshige, Oiso, the eighth station, in the 53 stations of the Tokaido. Need, however natural, taxes our patience. Our Lord has planted trees to shade and feed our path, hackberry and pine. But when the rains come, the coverings and hats we wove from reeds are no help. By bales and bundles we teach our lives to mean. By steps our journeys mark how we are spent on roads that never reach their end. We enter them and depart, and we obey and trade, carry and disown as if we too were spoiling cargo. We plot our humble get-by, a meager village is home for the storm, grateful warmth, a pot with almost soup. So little is so much. With two steps, we know enough to judge. This also appeared in the American Journal of Poetry. Now, this is the opening image of the 53 stations, which shows the Tokaido and his retinue crossing um, a bridge called the Nihon Bashi, which means the Japan Bridge, um, that leads you to the beginning of the road. Um, and then, you know, different people, merchants, fishmongers, and others are like moving out of the way so this huge retinue can come over this arch of the bridge and, and, and right into the foreground of the, of the print. Hiroshige Morning View, Nihon Bashi. Pre-dawn, I see my mother's reflection on the dark TV screen, a night of turmoil. She'll think it is evening when rising. A Lord is upon us in stark procession crossing the bridge. His servants sink from the weight they carry. The arch of wooden planks creaks 
and the fishmongers and dogs part to let it pass. I too must bend to salve her blanks of memory, dispel visions and visitors she admits might not be in gulps, fearing her mind. A gentle pilot cannot spare the waves or what's in them. No more can the Lord find a cause to not disrupt the poor who crave his struggle. He is an illusion as they to him. A light opens, then quits. Morning, then. That appeared in Stand magazine in England. And uh, the first image, that is the first station of the Tokaido, Hiroshige, is Shinarawa, it's right after you leave Edo, and it's up on the coast. And it's one of those prints that really shows how startling the Japanese artist's concept of geometry in a representation could be, and no wonder it influenced early modernists in Europe. Sunrise on the Great Road to Constructivism. Four catchful ships approach. Another is moored, its rudder geometrism dipping out of the bay. The women broach their wares to the daimyo's retinue in vain, for though they've just begun their task antiquity, they will exit right behind a cubist curtain of houses and pines. The image gravity finds the rudder, rectangles passing the lens of a triangle, a card gambled on the blue felt of visual thought. The coastal hive of dens and shacks stack up like chips, for the day has dealt and the struggle between flatness and the real is on. Art wagers on the dual soul. It has to be about the world and also about abstract properties. This one was published in Ekphrasis, a magazine out of California. This is uh, inspired by a print by Tsukyoka Yoshitoshi, from the series 100 Aspects of the Moon, a date from 1885 to 92. This is already technically after the Edo period really has ended. It ends in the, in the 1860s when Commodore Perry arrives and basically forces Japan to open up to the world. But still, the, the culture doesn't always stop, obviously, at the same time that a historical event happens. So, a very beautiful. A series of images. Another one of the prevailing images of of Edo period prints was the uh, were the beautiful women, the geishas, uh, the glamour of the feminine form, as well as images of of uh, urban life. There was a lot of images of urban life. It was uh, referred to as ukyo e. Ukyo means the floating world. That's how they referred to urban life. Edo was like a floating world, almost like an illusion. Fascinating. E just means pictures, images. So this one is entitled Cooling Off at Shiho. And it was published in December magazine. Tempting to think it is enough to lunge inward when the times crack and the demons stroll. At center's edge, the horizon is the plumb line, and muffled thunder plays the role of whisper. Her angled head hangs midway between a full moon and a lantern's drum, and notes the arcs her phantom foot mislays upon the water. The moon, too, is done with mirrors glow and seeks an echo, the brethren arc of moments spin. A panic unfolds in starfish wings upon the gray and crimson gown. 
though in her a reason sadness holds. Her hand sustains her on this final pier into the future a living past must peer. And with that, we end the Edel period inspired poems. And we enter the world of modern art. This one is, this is not a sonnet, it's free verse. And it's entitled Flamingo, 1973 to 74. Alexander Calder. It's a very famous uh, stable uh, sculpture of his that's in Chicago, a very important plaza surrounded by very, very beautiful modernist uh, buildings by Van der Rohe and others. This red, wonderful, crazy sculpture in the middle of all these very serious business buildings. Most nervous of lanky birds, yet icon of elegant patience. Forever sifting the concrete waters for critters too small to mourn. Whalers slaughtering or hunters mounting inedible horns merit our disgust. But not nature's methodical harvester. Cold, unfelt data is hunger's kiln. We ponder in arm crossed hum. At times, hearts. Chasing apart the pride, killing the giraffe colt, or the vulture squadron cleaning the beach of turtle hatchlings. Should we knight forth to save the insolvent brood? Flamingo, Rhea, ostrich faced a 19th century of ravenous fashion. Now the giant steel sculpture blushes among virile introvert pains. Bronze-jawed grids that universal mask the minds of colossi. Beauty drenches the otherwise desert, homages waiting an abrupt lift into pink fire. The clouds rattle with fake dawn. Such dance and flight made our freedoms with delicate beasts in dreams anchor images. This soldiers know a cannonball, too, is the child of arc and flame. And that appeared in the Saranac Review. I like saying where the poems come out because it's, it's important also to help these magazines get the word out that they exist. And I'm also very grateful to all of these magazines for publishing my work. It's important to, to do that. This one is entitled Ghost Orchid. It's a species of orchid which is native to the Florida Everglades and other, I think, some parts of the Caribbean as well, wetlands. It's very rare, um, but they're there. And it inspired Robert McKnight, a Miami-based sculptor, to do a wonderful series of sculptures with these, uh, um, I guess it was uh, uh, some sort of papers and... Uh, beautiful, just stunning pieces, and then put lights through them. And, um, the ghost orchid is called that because, well, there's various uh, explanations. One is that the flower, which is white, has these like almost like long petals, and it, but the, the the leaves are very very small or imperceptible, and they're like really they work their way like the roots into the bark, so the the flower looks like it's hovering in the middle of the of the uh, of the air like a ghost. Haunted by the promise of flowers, light pursues light, laps like water stolen to the salted shore, pretends by sure bends the crafted journey. It brings this brood of forms and hues to us and twists that fiction the straight line as the icon of truth. Veracity is of a different mind, mantled, fluted, bone translucent, and smoke sprung from veined roots that vine unleaved upon a trunk. It hovers, seeming in what fractions time allows to argue the impossible 
beauty. The mute, bewildered, true, will not be the ruler tamed, nor taunt the reaping of causalities. It will appear, vessel glow, in rebel stillness, forbidden to settle. And that is a sonnet, and it appeared in the American Poetry Review. This um, poem, uh, after a painting titled Ice and Space Time 20, 2015 by Julio Larraz, a very great Cuban sculpt, uh, sculptor and painter, mostly painter. And this appeared in Ekphrasis. Vapor, too, is present, always. Ghost shocking, yet boredom's ubiquity. The block of ice ignites our view of lost fires, blue infernos. Ice is the frailty that gulps a sea, masks and unmasks the noon of fallen fruit. These lumber like dice and catch us catching them in the mercurial flask of spilled mirror, angled by the sun. The ice has paved onto the stage. The frigid stare pages and wombs the warps with which the mind consoles us in this drowning clock. No rest in sea or block, nor in bled silvers, nor in rind or spheres, nothing but what escapes the scene into the area of light from matter's scheme. And this sonnet, the last one was also a sonnet, uh, is entitled G's Bend, and it's inspired by the famous quilts that uh, were made there beginning in the post-Civil War period by African and women, Af African American women who were sharecroppers or families of sharecroppers had settled in this part of the Mississippi called G's Bend. It was obviously a bend and it was originally a plantation. And it has an epigraph, 2 Samuel 14, 14, uh, one of my favorite lines in the Hebrew scripture, uh, a woman uh, who has been sent by a general to speak to King David to try to get him to reconcile with his rebellious son Absalom uh, tells him the story about how he, she has lost families in this war and, you know, and so forth. Uh, and tells the king, after all, we are all like water spilled on the ground that can never be gathered up again. Wonderful image of the, of the brevity of life. We're just like a spill and it slowly dries up and we disappear. Geez, Ben. The, the quilts are amazing. They're considered masterpieces. Of, uh, of, of, of art, not just popular art or folk art or whatever. They're, they're dazzling in the way that they play with forms and geometries, again, predating um, modernist abstraction by decades. In their agile, cracked geometries of patches, homaging sun, on slow water or leaves slouching off at season's end to weave the ground. These urgent quilts foretell the reaches of modernist form when, sprung at last by rebel color, it captures the wills nature ignores. What petals, wings, and scales teach are compliments or artful shading that cast a thing as knitted to its place. Stark composure meets composition in these fields that guide the dreamer's mazed warmth and luxuries provide the river's pour. Let image wander unsure if it seeks horizon or shelter. Can pattern's hearth forbid sleep to meander like water on this earth? This was published in the Sheraton Review. These quilts are also astonishing, and they, they weren't just the ones there, geez, Ben. I mean, quilts were made by uh, the wives and daughters of farmers all over the United States. But and throughout, what was wonderful, of course, they use simple cotton, and they, and they quilted with uh, 
Well, actually, they, they don't, I don't know, they use whatever cloth they could, some of it rags, and then they quilt it with raw cotton, or if they could get wool, then even better. And that's how they would create something warm. Uh, and, and yet, for all of its practicality, these, all these quilts are astonishing images. Beauty was always part of the warmth of life. Uh, this one is, these last two poems actually are from a series I've been working on lately, uh, inspired by uh, Key Largo. M uh, my girlfriend and I have a house there on a canal, and I've gotten endless pleasure and inspiration from being so close to the ocean and seeing the seabirds and the yachts and the manatees and all sorts of creatures uh, on, the, uh, on the canal. It's quite beautiful. And this, of course, is at the beginning of the pandemic. It's entitled Cytokine Storm, the Croc in Plague Time. Sequestered on my balcony, I glance an odd lump in the channel. Floats slower than the tide, turning to scan, perhaps, and it stops. A hunter's calm, I think, in which it hides. Then it lurks forward with intent. I hurl a cigar butt to see it hook the splash. It turns like thought again. Yesterday, a manatee neared a neighbor's dock and guzzled water from a hose for an hour. A six-foot prey, lotus drunk. How innocent it seems in its golden shower now that I know how the water can darken. At dock's edge, I tempt a view of death. But see a boatman's dodger's cap instead. This was published in the American Journal of Poetry. And then finally, this poem, which was actually the first one I did from my Key Largo series. And uh, I dedicated it to my sister who died shortly after I had written this. She did read it and loved it. Uh, died of cancer after an eight year struggle with uh, trying to overcome it. Key Largo, Nightfall. Beneath the sloth sweep of cerulean doves, the thrown anchors of pelicans and gulls nervous proud, native to anger appetites. I watch the last hour of daylight's damascene of copper fronds the tide has etched on our canal. The place and its catch of scents, the sea is but 200 feet to the south, simmers lost memories replete with the home my child played innocent of promised loss and my adult misspent in ambition's pleasures. But I am old now, and accounting is my muse. When how is when, and where is why, and summary nets a season's clarity. My cradle city, derided by history, returns in smells and tastes where my sister taught me to speak, and exile fates turned like a coming storm. Our hands received caterpillars from oleanders we believed we had tricked to wander there, so natural their passage from home to flesh. Time's feral moments profit those slight creatures which we set down on the proper leaves to nurture their ways through change. Sixty years later, I shed my silken cage by dark 
water. That appeared in the American Journal of Poetry. Thank you very much.